Well, good morning to everybody joining us online. It is so awesome to be able to worship together. And wow, has this ever been a week? I mean, uh, so we started off with Good Friday, three services, piles of people. It was amazing. Then we had four Easter services, 22 people uh, were baptized. Then we had First Tuesday on Tuesday night with 100 people coming together to pray. And then something else happened Tuesday night. Well, then at 1035 Tuesday night, we became grandparents for the first time. Yeah, we want to uh, introduce you to our, uh, our little Judah Jameson, uh, cutest little guy in the world, and uh, Amy and James, our daughter and son-in-law, are doing great, and what a thrill that was this week. It's taken over our week. It sure has. We've been quite distracted, yeah. to say the least, yeah. but today uh, we want to begin with a game before okay. you start the teaching. All right. What's All it, what, right. How does this work? Well, it's going to be a word game. I'm going to say a word in Spanish or in French. You know Spanish or French? Well, not well, like just perquito. Oh, yeah. very impressive. But okay. I want to um, give you those words, and okay. I want you to tell me what they mean in English. Okay. Are there prizes? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves here, okay? okay? I know you love a prize, but let's just see how you do. Okay. Okay? Yep. All right. First word in Spanish. Carpeta. Easy. Carpet. Well, not quite. It means folder. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here. Try another one. Okay. In Spanish. Introducer. Well, that's somebody who's on the radio who introduces somebody. Well, and that sounds like it should be, right? Yeah, but it it's is. actually insert. Oh. Okay. You're not uh, doing so good here. Let's, let, let's try another okay. one. Maybe we'll try it in French I'm this much time. better at French. Okay. okay. Blanquette. Uh, a wet blanket. Uh, no. Uh, veal stew. Well, it's kind of like a wet blanket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I think you'll get this one. This okay. is a good one. In French, blessier. Uh, what you do to me, you bless me. Oh, that's so sweet. But no, it is to wound or injure or hurt. <laughs> what you also do to me. Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Okay, in French, un patron. Uh, a customer, a patron who comes to your shop. Uh, not quite. It's boss. Okay, this is a dumb game. Well, it's my game, and you just have to put up with it here, okay? okay. In French, salé. Uh, a salad. Uh, no, it is dirty. A dirty salad. Well, not quite, okay. no. Okay. Okay, I know you'll get this one. This is a really easy one. It's in Spanish, constipado. You are just sick. Actually, that's what it is. I got one right? It is sick. Wow, okay. Very good. I got well one right. done. You got okay, one I get right. A prize. Yes, okay. let's there cheer for him. Okay. Okay, final one yep. in Spanish. Embarrassada. What happens when you play a game and you lose miserably? Uh, you get embarrassed. No, it means pregnant. That was close. Yeah. Okay, you anyway, got a really dumb okay. game. Well, you know what? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on well, with your teaching. Th these, these words uh, actually have a phrase that go with them. They're called false friends. Uh, so they, they make you think one thing, uh, but they trick you into it, and, and they're actually not true. And we're going to be looking at a single word today that is not technically a false friend, but sort of gives us that idea because we misunderstand this word so badly. It is so misunderstood, especially in church world. Now, before we get into that, uh, if you're just joining us today or uh, recently, you need to know that we are on week 21 of a 52-week series we're calling Echoes Catechism in a Year. The word echoes comes from the Greek word katecheo, which means to echo or resound. And so this whole idea of catechism came about where the teacher would bellow out a question and the students would be able to answer back, to echo back the, the answer. Now, we're not technically doing the, the call and response, but we want to be taking a look at the 52 of the, uh, the hardest, most challenging, most difficult questions of our faith and have an answer for them. And so together, uh, we're going through this series, but we're also building an app. And so you can go on the Riverwood app. You can go on the website. If you click on Echoes, it's going to take you to uh, the topic page. The topic page is a topic per month for an entire year. Uh, the topic that we're going into for the month of April is Echoes of Salvation. And when you click on that, it's going to lead you to the questions. So our question today, question 21 is, what is repentance? What is repentance? 
Now, when you click on the question, it's going to take you to an answer page. If you scroll down there, you're going to see a number of other headings. One of them is the sermon notes. The sermon notes, you can fill in the blanks, and you can also keep your own notes on the sermon page. They're going to stay on your phone, and then there's Bible reading for this entire week to come, as well as a, uh, uh, a video, a 60-second video. It takes the entire message and compresses it into 60 seconds so that you know what the answer to this question is. So our question today is, what is repentance? Repentance is something of a false friend in the sense that we misunderstand this word horribly, as I hope to be able to show you today. Now, it's easily misunderstood. Uh, in fact, if you click on any sermon on, on the web on repentance, you're undoubtedly going to see a preacher do this. He's going to say, repentance is walking one direction. You're walking towards something. You're walking towards some sort of sin, and you have your back towards God. You're going towards this sin. You realize that God is calling you, so you stop that behavior, and you turn, and you start coming towards God. It's doing a 180. It's doing a 180. So you are living your life, and you were drinking too much. You repent from that. You drink less. You come towards God. You were living your life. You're hooked on pornography. You have a bad attitude. You're, you're cheating on your taxes. Whatever, whatever the issue is you're going this direction, you do a 180, you change your behavior, and you go this direction. Undoubtedly, that's what you're going to see. I've preached that before, but I've come to realize that that is not the definition of repentance. That is not what repentance is. So what we want to do today is I want to teach out five undeniable truths about repentance. And here's the first one. Repentance is a concept that has been stolen. Now, I was going to start this point with repentance has become obsolete. Repentance is out of vogue. Nobody wants to talk about repentance anymore, but I realize that it's worse than that. Back in 1937, the American Tract Society uh, launched a contest, and they were asking for pastors in particular to, to write a new book on a theology that has been left aside, that, that people are neglecting. In 1937, Dr. Harry Ironside wrote a book uh, about repentance, and this was the first line in his book. He said this, fully convinced in my own mind that the doctrine of repentance is the missing note, think about a piano keyboard, it's a missing note in many otherwise orthodox and fundamentally sound circles today. I have penned this volume out of a full heart. What Dr. Ironside was observing was that in the keyboard of theology back in 1937, somebody had stolen the white key of repentance. The note of repentance was missing. Now, I think today, if Dr. Ironside could see our world to see our churches, he'd probably see, say that a whole bunch of the notes have been stolen. But regardless, this is a key doctrine that even back in 1937 was, was a stolen doctrine. Why is it stolen? How did it get stolen? Well, first of all, pastors. Pastors are to blame. Because pastors, not wanting to upset their people, not wanting to preach the hard truths of Scripture, have, have kind of gotten away from preaching on repentance because they believe that their people don't want to listen to the hard truths of, of Scripture. Culture, with its uh, you do you, live your own truth, there's no such thing as objective truth, you decide whatever you think is right messaging, has eradicated the idea of sin or a need for repentance. And many conclude that repentance is just a bad word. It's a bad negative word that people don't want to hear about and don't want to be called to, and therefore uh, what we would rather preach is we'd rather preach grace. We'd rather preach, preach love. So nobody is preaching or talking about repentance. It's being stolen out of our culture. Point number two, repentance is the first word of the gospel. Repentance is the first word of the gospel. Now, when we share the gospel or think of the gospel, we often think about grace, or we love to preach love, or, or the forgiveness or the sacrifice of Jesus. We think that that is the first word of the gospel, but a quick study shows us that actually, literally, the word repentance is the first word of the gospel. In fact, let me show you uh, with some overwhelming evidence that this is true. John, in beginning to preach and prepare the way for Jesus, said this, repent, first word, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. 
Jesus, when he starts preaching his message, he, literally the first word of the gospel is this, Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Mark, recording in Mark chapter 1, quoting Jesus, said this, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is teaching. He makes it very clear, super clear. You will perish unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish. A couple more. Jesus, after handing the baton to the apostles in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter's preaching. He says this, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And later on, Peter's preaching in Acts 3.19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. You might be sitting there going, hold it a second, how did I miss this? How did I miss the fact that repentance is so integral and so key to the gospel? Well, it's actually even more than that. It's not just the beginning of the gospel. It's not just the, the first word of the gospel. If you track through Jesus' teaching, you realize that the entire message that Jesus came to give was a call and an invitation to repent. Not only that, not only was it the beginning, it's also the end. You see, repentance is not just a, a little side road. It is the main highway of the gospel. Repentance is not just kind of a little side idea. It is the doorway to the kingdom of God. In the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus, the word repent is used nine times as Jesus continues at the end of the book of the Bible. He continues to send out this message, you must repent. Repentance is not just the beginning. It's not just the initiation. We often think of, of repentance as being that day I gave my life to Christ, and then that's it. It was the entire gospel all the way through the gospel. And that's why Jesus said, you will perish unless you repent of your sin and turn to God. And I tell you again, unless you repent, you will perish. Undeniable truth number three. Repentance is not a bad word. It's actually an incredibly good word. It is so packed full of blessing and promise and advantage. It is absolutely amazing. It's not a bad word. It's a really, really good word. Now, again, I'm throwing stuff at you uh, in an attempt to overwhelm you. I want to over overwhelm you with the evidence. And so if you're not taking it all in at once, it's, it's all in the app. You can go back and take a look at it. But I want to give you seven blessings or benefits that come straight out of Scripture as to the benefit and the blessing and the advantage there is when we repent. Listen to this. Number one, repentance brings you close to the Lord of heaven's armies. Man, that sounds great, doesn't it? Zechariah 1.3. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. In the Old Testament, the word repent isn't used. It's return to me. It's kind of the same concept. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. It brings us close to our God. Secondly, repentance triggers a cleansing of your soul. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Thirdly, repentance ushers God's mercy, His blessing, His, His closeness, His favor into our lives. Proverbs 28, 13. People who conceal their sin will not prosper, but if you confess and turn from them, you will receive mercy. Fourthly, repentance is the key to God's kingdom. Matthew 4, 17, from the time that Jesus began preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is God's invitation for us to enter into his kingdom, and it starts with repentance. Fifthly, repentance leads to life, not death. Acts eleven eighteen. God has granted repentance, literally says this, God has granted repentance that leads to life. That's how important repentance is. Next one, repentance aligns us with God's strategy. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. There it is again. It's so critical. And lastly, repentance triggers God's forgiveness. Luke 24, 47, this message was proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, and here's the message, 
There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. Repentance is an incredibly good word. It is so jam-packed with blessing and advantage. It's a gateway to much of God's favor. So if that's true, if it's so jam-packed with blessing and advantage and, and benefit, then how is it that repentance has gotten such a bad rap? Well, that's easy. Because repentance is dangerous. Repentance is offensive. Repentance is confrontational. It's provocative. It's threatening. It's hazardous and even hostile towards sin. And we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with pride. We all struggle with this desire to be our own boss, to be our own authority to be right. We want to do life on our terms. We want to to do life in a way that we don't call it this, but we have this human pride that says, I am the CEO of my own life. I am the boss of my own life. Repentance is is beautiful and is jam-packed with blessing, but it costs us our pride, and it costs us our sin. And we don't part with our sin very easily. Repentance gets ugly when there's a clash of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the flesh and the world and myself and the kingdom of God. And that is where repentance becomes difficult for us, when those two kingdoms clash. So our sinful prideful, self-protecting nature, repentance is dangerous and bad and terrifying. It's a terrifying word because it means unconditional surrender to our God. And therefore, we resist repentance, which leads to our fourth undeniable truth about repentance. Repentance is critical for citizenship in God's kingdom. If you want to be a citizen of God's kingdom, repentance is absolutely essential. Dual citizenship, here's another way of saying this, dual citizenship is prohibited. You're you're not allowed in God's kingdom to, to be part of God's kingdom and part of some other kingdom. I, I want to make this really, really clear. And so I'd love to, to read a portion of a book by Richard Owen Roberts named Repentance, the First Word of the Gospel. It's a little bit of a longer portion, so I'd love for you to stick with me. But I want you to get the, the sense of how important it is for entry into the kingdom of God. Here's what he says. All those born into the kingdom of this world remain in that kingdom unless by a miracle of divine grace they are born again, born a second time, born of the Spirit of God into the kingdom of God. Consider these sobering propositions. As citizens of the kingdom of darkness, we are not fit subjects for the kingdom of light. Therefore, we must repent. As citizens of the kingdom of this world, we are barred from citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. For no man can serve two masters, therefore we must repent. As citizens of the kingdom of Satan, we have interests and loyalties that have no place in the kingdom of God, therefore we must repent. As citizens of the kingdom of death, we can find no place in the kingdom of life, for it is not a place of cadavers and cemeteries, therefore we must repent. As active citizens of the kingdom of evil, we cannot be admitted to the kingdom of righteousness, for neither evil nor evil ones are permitted to enter. Therefore, we must repent. As citizens of of a perishing kingdom, we have nothing to do with the imperishable kingdom. Therefore, we must repent. As citizens of the kingdom of flesh, we do not belong in and could not relate to the kingdom of spirit. Therefore, we must repent. In speaking of the kingdom of God, we are speaking not of a democracy but of a monarchy. There is no voting there. The kingdom belongs to the... Now, that's a lot of teaching about repentance, which should all lead you to a question right about now. What is repentance? 
Well, we've, we've used the word over and over. We've talked a lot about it. But what really is it? And how is it that this word is so misunderstood? Well, this leads to the fifth and final of our undeniable truths about repentance. Number five, repentance doesn't start with behavior. It starts with perspective. Repentance doesn't start with behavior. It starts with perspective. Most of us have dreadfully misunderstood repentance. In fact, I would have to say that even as a pastor, until digging in this past week, being forced to dig in because of our catechism series, I, I did not fully understand repentance. Somehow we've come to think of repentance as stop doing something bad and turn our behavior to do something good, but that is not repentance. In the ancient Greek that the New Testament originated in, the word that is translated repent is metanoeo. Metanoeo is, is made up of two words. The, the meta part is to move or to, to change. The noeo part is to think or perception. Repent doesn't mean to change your behavior. Repent literally means to change your mind, to change your thinking. The changing of behavior is the fruit and the product of changing your mind. Another way of saying this would be to shift the weightiness of your life. You see, I, I think of life in terms of scales. And there are many people who have piled all the weighty things of their life onto themselves. They're very, very self-centered. They're very self-sufficient. They, they get a little bit of their cues from the world, so they pile some of the weightiness of the world, but they have no use for God at all, so there is no weight on God. Everything is on them or the world. Uh, then there are some other people who, who at least add a little bit to God. So they, they will add a little bit of church. They will add a little bit of volunteering. They'll add a little bit of, of service to, to God, and, and they'll put a little bit of the weight on, onto God. But the most of it is, is on themselves and most of it on the world. Now, there are other people who have put all the weight on the world. So they put all the weighty things. They, they, they have a little bit for themselves, but the majority of the weightiness that they have in their lives is all stacked onto, onto the world. So they get their authority from the world. They get their truth from the world. They, they get definitions of sexuality from the world. They, they get values on money and, and time and, and all the what's important in their entertainment. It's all piled on the world with a little bit over a, onto God. But repentance is to think differently, to, to give the weighty parts of your life, the most weighty parts of your life to God. So that, that God becomes the one who, who now dictates and, and guides you with, with your use of time and your money and your priorities and who has authority and your entertainment in your life and your sexuality and your definitions and your attitudes. It all comes onto God. This is, this is what it means to, to repent, to change your mind about where the weightiness of your life rests letting God set the pace and dictating uh, every part and dedicating every part of your life to Him. Repentance doesn't start with behavior. It starts with your thinking. In, in fact, if we take a look at these Scriptures and if we were to uh, put in the literal definition, we would, we would hear John saying in Matthew 3, 2, turn your mind around and think about your sins differently and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. We would hear Jesus literally saying in, in Matthew 4, 17, change how you think for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the key to getting into the kingdom of heaven is changing how you think. Luke 13, you will perish unless you think differently and turn to God, unless you repent. And I tell you again that unless you change how you think, you will perish. Repentance is changing how you think, changing your mind about God. 
Repentance, the changing of your mind and how you think about God, where you put your weight, is a beautiful bondage breaker. It, it sets you free. It's life freeing, uh, God connecting experience that God invites every single person into. He says, I want you to see me for who I really am. I, I want you to have a right understanding of, of, of who I am in your life and who I am in this universe. I want you to shift your perspective on, on your side of eternity now. I'm giving you the opportunity to do that because my fear is that one day, Everybody's perspective is going to shift. Everybody is going to repent. Everybody's going to come to a place of understanding who God really is. But many will not do it on this side of eternity. They will do it on the other side of eternity. And they will find that their knees buckle and they cannot help but kneel before this God who has had victory over self and victory over the world and is the only one left standing. And they will see God for who He really is. But God invites us to repent now, to change our minds about Him now. Sometimes this mind shift is about where we put the weightiness of our lives, but sometimes it's just about having a different perspective. For for seeing God for how truly magnificent and stunning and worthy and glorious and mighty and, and, and to put it bluntly, how big He really is. Do you have a big view of God or do you have a small view of God? I want to share with you three perspective-shifting ideas that help me in my perspective of God to know who's boss and, and what God's place is. In fact, I want to start with Psalm 90, verse 2. This one helps me all the time. It says this, Before the mountains were formed, I love mountains, they're so massive, they're so majestic. Before the mountains were formed, or the earth and the world were brought forth, you are God from eternity to eternity. You are God from eternity to eternity. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this idea of eternity. So I like to think in really tangible kinds of ways, and I find that painter's tape helps me. So if we were to take this painter's tape, Mark, you want to give me a hand? We're going we're gonna to illustrate eternity here. So let's, uh, let's illustrate eternity. Mark's just going to pull that. We're going we're gonna to create a timeline, okay? So keep going, keep going. You're going to have to keep going. Yeah, in fact, why don't you just go to the doors? Yeah. Okay, keep going, keep going. You're doing good. Okay, that's... You know what? Why don't, why, don't you, why don't you go to the parking lot? Yeah, just, yeah, just go right out the doors. Just, just go. Yeah, just keep going. You're, no, you don't need a jacket. Just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, that's great. Okay, just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. Keep going. This is eternity here we're talking about, okay? Now, now imagine, we're going to have to use our imaginations. Imagine that Mark walked to Kenora, very long roll of tape. Uh, imagine that Mark walked to Toronto. Uh, He walked all the way to Halifax, and now we're just beginning to get a sense of eternity. Uh, Actually, he he went all the way, he caught a boat, and he went all the way to England. Now, we're beginning to get a sense of, of how big eternity is. Now, on this line of eternity, let's mark my life and your your life, shall we? Here's our lives. We'll just, uh, oh, what are you doing there, buddy? What are you doing? You're ruining my illustration. Pull it tight, pull it tight. There you go. All right. All right, so your life and my life, right? Right there. That's it, right there. That one centimeter line on this tape that goes from here to England, it keeps on going. That one centimeter line is your life and my life. That's our perspective. We think that, that life revolves around us and that, that the whole universe revolves around us. That, that's your life. If God should bless you with with 60, 70, 80, 90 years, that is your life right there. In fact, let me show you out of the Scriptures where this comes from. Psalm 102. Psalm 102 says this, My life possesses, passes as swiftly as the evening shadow. I am withering away like grass. But you, O Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure for every generation. Your life is like a little tick on a piece of painter's tape that goes from here to England. Your life is like a shadow 
that passes by so quickly. Your life is, is like a blade of grass that is here and then withers and is gone. This is perspective. Now, you might be sitting there saying, you're depressing me. <laughs> why, why, would you do, why would you show me something so discouraging and depressing? Well, the fact is that there's nothing. This is, this is actually such good news because God loves you so much. I mean, what, why, why should God even pay attention to you? It says in Psalm 8, 4, it says, What are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care about them? But here's the crazy thing. He does. As puny as you are, he thinks about you. As short as your life is in in comparison to eternity, he died for you and said, I want you with me for eternity from here to England on the painter's tape. We see this 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years as, as being so huge and so important, and I'm the boss of my own life. You are not the boss of your own life. You are part of God's eternity, and he's inviting you into it. He's inviting you into the eternity. Painter's tape helps me to get some perspective. So does, so does a grain of sand. I don't expect you to be able to see that from there, but there's a single grain of sand right here. And I want you to use your imaginations that this single grain of sand is the earth, the entire earth. You live on this single grain of sand. Now, we're going to put the single grain of sand in front of the world's largest building, the Burj Khalifa. The Burj Khalifa is the world's tallest skyscraper located in Dubai. It's 830 meters into the air, almost half of a, of a mile into the air with a remarkable 163 floors. In this world's largest building, there are 30,000 homes, nine hotels, eight acres of parkland, a 30-acre artificial lake. This is mind-blowing, and I want you to imagine that that building, the world's largest building, is God, and the earth is a grain of sand sitting on the sidewalk in front of that building. That's perspective. And again, I am not making this up. This is straight out of the Scriptures. Isaiah chapter 40 says this, Who else has held the ocean in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? For all of the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of of sand. When you begin to see God for who He really is, when you understand your place in eternity, when you understand your place in the universe on this earth in comparison to God, this is repentance, beginning to change your mind about who God is and who you are. I find that there's one more helpful little illustration for me to understand my role, often we kind of see ourselves as, as being a candle in this world. And so we're, we're burning bright at 800 degrees Celsius, and we feel really good about, about the impact we're having, how we're, we're smart, we're illuminating, we're bright, we're bright people, we're, we're amazing. And, and some of you say, no, no, you know what, I don't really relate to the candle thing. I, I'm not so much a candle, I'm more of a blowtorch. I burn at 1,500 degrees Celsius. My life is big. It's amazing, which is awesome, and I think I'm starting my Bible on fire. However, even if you are a blowtorch, I want you to realize that God is the sun. Think of a blowtorch in comparison to the sun. The sun travels at 200 kilometers a second. I, I, I have a hard time believing these stats, but they're from NASA. If you were to take the earth and you were to multiply it and, and fill up the sun with the earth, with earths, it would take 1.3 million earths to fill the sun. 
it would take 64.3 million moons of our moons to fill the sun. That's how gargantuan the sun is, and it burns at its core at 15 million degrees Celsius. Even if you are a blowtorch, you are burning at 1,500 degrees Celsius, not 15 million degrees Celsius. This is God's power and grandeur and holiness in comparison to who you and I are. I want you to listen to how Isaiah responds. All he saw was a vision of God, and he realized he was done. He was toast. He was nothing in comparison to God. He says this, the angels were calling, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me. Woe to me, he says. I cried, I am ruined. I'm but a, a, a little tick on the eternity tape. I'm but a little grain of sand. I live in a grain of sand. I'm, I'm but a little blowtorch in comparison to the sun. Woe is me, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah had a repentance moment where he changed his mind about who God really is. Listen, if you're struggling with some sin, if you're struggling to, you know, and you wonder, why is it that I can't obey the Word of God? You know, God gives me these commands, and, I, and I'm going this direction, and I'm struggling with these commands, and I struggle to, to, to be able to actually obey Him. I want you to know this. Your ability to obey God is directly proportionate to how big your God is, to your view of God. If you have a very large view of God, it's not that hard to tithe. It's not that hard to rearrange your time and priorities to serve God. It's not that hard to put a knife in the back of your own selfish pride and to sacrifice things. It's not that hard to even rearrange your life and to be obedient for, to, to God in terms of sexuality, in terms of priorities, in terms of attitudes, in terms of who has the, the say in your life. When your view of God is really, really big, you gladly kneel before this God. But when you have a small view of God, when you think of God as your buddy, when you think of God as part of a religion that you go to on a Sunday, when, when you have this small view of God and you think that maybe God's just a little bigger and a little smarter than you are, you have no motivation and no ability to change the behavior. Your behaviors will follow your mind. And God calls us to repent, to change our minds about God. So, what is repentance? Repentance is not a behavior change, but a change of mind. It's the first word of the gospel, essential for citizenship in God's kingdom. Repentance brings us closer to God, triggers our soul cleansing, and ushers in God's mercy and forgiveness. It is a call to recognize the weightiness of God's authority in our lives and embrace His sovereignty with humility and reverence. Behavior change follows true repentance. So I need to ask you today, is there something that you need to repent from? Does your, does your mind need to change so that you see God for who He really is and you right-size God and you right-size your own life? And when you do, the behaviors will follow. We're going to take a few moments to worship in response, and maybe you want to just take a moment with your head bowed, even as we begin to worship. And maybe there's some things you need to say to God. Maybe you even need to say, God, I want to repent right now. I want to repent of my pride 
and, and me thinking that I'm the, the boss of my own life and that I'm such a big deal. I'm not, I'm not a big deal when it comes to who you are. Take a few moments to repent and then we'll worship together.